bless you. God bless you all. First of all, I want to let you know how much I respect Pastor Joey and Rita. And join me in thanking the Lord for such tremendous pastors right here in Pace, Florida. Well, history is not prophetic, but it is predictive. Past behavior is the best indicator of future performance. And so one of the things I did was research every single century of recorded human history to try to find out what the most common form of government is. And so I put together a PowerPoint. And the uh, once it comes up here somewhere on the screen, there you go. Uh, so there's my website. And I sent out a daily history email that you can sign up for there, as well as, as videos and articles and so forth. Um, so let's learn some lessons from history. Uh, God created Adam and Eve, they fell, Cain kills Abel, and then you got Nimrod. Nimrod, uh, Josephus said he wanted to build a tower so high that if God destroyed the world again with a flood, he could survive on top. So it had this defiant attitude toward God and that Nimrod uh, made everyone in town bake bricks and bring them or he would kill them. So it's defiant against God, oppressive over man. And uh, that was the first attempt at a world government, right? So civilization began in Mesopotamia and this was the first notable civilization and he wanted to be the head of it. Uh, he wanted to be the first antichrist. I mean, that, that's basically what it was, the spirit there. and. Uh, God confuses the languages and the people scatter into language groups. And those language groups turn into nations. Nations is God's invention to prevent a one world government. You take the population of the world, break it into groups, and they're competitive against each other, right? To keep it from reconcentrating back into a one world government. But every generation, you get some leader that wants to conquer a bunch of nations and wants to go back to this. And so you have uh, Gilgamesh, king of Uruk. He's the first one to build a wall around the city. Uh, matter of fact, the uh, uh, Oldest story ever written in any language is the Epic of Gilgamesh in the ancient Akkadian language. And it has him going on a long journey to meet an old guy who survived the global flood. Calls it a global flood. And this, they actually uh, talk about him building a big boat, covering with tar and pitch, um, and then after the flood, repopulating the world. It's the story of Noah. And it's included in this Epic of Gilgamesh. And this is a thousand years before Moses, before Moses writes. Um, and so over a hundred ancient civilizations have flood stories in their ancient past. Gee, maybe there really was a flood. I believe there was. And then you have Sargon of Acadia conquers a bunch of walled cities to consider the first empire from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean. And then you have 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs and uh, 5,000 years of Chinese emperors and uh, king of Assyria, 700 BC. And he is um, the one who takes the 10 northern tribes of Israel captive. It's the biggest empire on the planet at the time, but it's conquered by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which is conquered by Persia. And you have Cyrus of Persia. He's got the biggest empire that the planet has ever seen up to this point. And he's the one who lets the Jews go back and rebuild the temple. Persia is conquered by Alexander the Great. He's got the biggest empire around 330 BC. And then he stopped from going into India. And you have Chandra Gupta of the Maura Empire in India controlling a quarter of the world's population, even way back then. And then you have uh, the Roman Empire. And uh, it's the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen up to this point. Uh, if, if you ever see um, a seashell that goes a little circle, a little bigger circle, a little bigger, bigger circle, uh, that's actually a rate of geometric expansion called the Fibonacci sequence or phi, P-H-I, or the golden ratio. And it's applied to economics, it's applied to investments like you know crypto or whatever. And I decided to apply it to history and began to look. And sure enough, you see the little circle, bigger circle, bigger, and they keep, with military advancements, kings can kill more people. So instead of Cain killing Abel with a rock, they can kill with a bronze weapon or an iron weapon or a phalanx spear or a scimitar sword or gunpowder or drones or directed energy weapons like space-based uh, lasers and particle beams and microwaves. All right, the weapon improves, but it's that same fall in nature of Cain killing Abel. And Augustus Caesar wanted to have the first world tracking system. Around 2 BC, he wanted to have a census. 
That was like modern technology. If he could add 5G and cell phones and satellites and face recognition software, he would have been tempted to use that. And then you have the Askamite Empire in Africa and Attila the Hun, 450 AD. He has an army of a half a million men wiping out cities across Europe, Mainz, Reims, uh, headed toward Paris. A little Saint Genevieve, a young woman, gets all of Paris to fast and pray, and Attila skips second Paris. But you read the writings of the Christians in, in that time? They write that Attila is the Antichrist. But he had the spirit of Antichrist, right? Any one of these guys would have been happy to. So, so in that sense, death is a blessing, and the devil has to start from scratch again. Um, you know, the, the devil went to Jesus and said, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world for their mind to give. I can give them to whoever I want. And you're thinking, well, that's pretty audacious. And of course, Jesus says, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But you're like, when did the devil get all the kingdoms of the world? When Adam sinned. Adam was in charge of the garden. We know that because he named everything. When you name something, you have kids, you name your kids, you have authority over your kids. Adam was the, the authority. But the Bible says, to whomever you yield your members, servants to obey, to him you are a servant. The moment Adam obeyed Satan, he was posturing himself as the one taking the orders and the devil is the one giving the orders. And then all the kingdoms of the world have one thing in common. They have a dictator who rules through fear. That's the motivating energy. And, um, and then Jesus said, the, the kings of the Gentiles rule over them, but it shall not be so among you. He that is greatest among you shall be the servant of all. I am among you as he that serveth. So we're talking kingdoms, and Jesus is saying, those are top down through fear, minds bottom up through love. And um, anyway, then you have the uh, uh, Islam. Uh, and so you have 7th century AD, and Islam conquers from the Persian Gulf, conquers Egypt, which used to be Christian, Syria, which used to be Christian, Turkey, which used to be Christian, Spain, right, was conquered for 700 years. And then uh, you have uh, the Muslims are stopped at the Battle of Tours by Charles Martel. His grandson is Charlemagne. He's got the biggest empire, controls all of Europe around 800 AD. And then the Vikings, 1000 AD. They have boats with low keels. They go up every river in Europe and Russia, and, and they've got the biggest empire. And then you have Genghis Khan, 1200 AD. He kills 30 million people from Korea to Hungary to Russia. And um, what? Uh, if he hadn't have died, he'd have been happy to keep killing and, and conquer the world. And then you have his grandson, Kublai Khan, and Tamerlane, 17, uh, killed 17 million people in the 1300s. And then Ivan the Terrible of Russia, 12 time zones. And uh, then you have, the, in this hemisphere, Aztec Montezuma. Uh, and he, they're capturing tribes, taking them to the top of the temple, ripping their hearts out to the sun god and Atahualpa and Incan of Peru. And then the king of Spain, 1500s, has the biggest empire that planet Earth had ever seen up to this point. Uh, the Philippines are named after his son, King Philip of Spain. And then the 1600s, the King of France has the biggest empire the planet had seen, Louis XIV, the Sun King. And then finally, the King of England in the 1700s, 1800s, 13 million square miles, a half a billion people. The King of England was a globalist. He was a one world government guy with him at the top. America's founders didn't like that. They broke away and flipped it and made the people the king. So the most common form of government in world history is gangs. If we were to wake up tomorrow with no police, what would happen? It'd be fine for a couple days, and then people would rob stores. And when they got away with it, they would begin to uh, go house to house. And then we would get our neighborhood together and say, we got to protect ourselves. And we'd find somebody that knows how to fight. And we said, look, you be our captain. And then the, on the bad side, they would find their bad gang leader, and we'd be, we'd be back to gangs, good gangs and bad gangs, but they would demand loyalty. And, and so uh, in all of this, one nation stands out. Around 1400 BC, millions of people came out of Egypt. And for 400 years, they did not have a king. It was ancient Israel. And it worked because every single citizen was taught the law and they were personally accountable to God to follow the law. And it worked for 400 years until what? The priests stopped teaching the law. They go, they did? Yeah, here's Eli, the high priest. His own sons are sleeping with women in the tent where the Ark of the Covenant is. And then you have a Levite with a silver graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. And I think, isn't that one of the commandments? You're not supposed to have graven images. And then there's a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite's to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with the woman he's not even married to. He's not following the law. He's certainly not teaching it. 
And so the people turn into chaos. They, they got this concubine is raped and these sodomites banging on the door, something about that behavior that appears at the very last stages of a people ruling themselves. This abandonment to passion, casting off of self-restraint. And all the people go to Samuel the prophet and they say, this self-government system's not working anymore. We want to be like all the other countries. We want a king. Samuel cries and the Lord tells him, they did not reject you. They rejected me. And so uh, you have the most common form of government. So a, a gang leader is called the king. Right? You can call him Pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, Sultan, Tsar. The name changes, but it's one person that calls the shots. It's hierarchical. If you are friends with the guy at the top, you are more equal. If you are not their friend, you are less equal. And if you're their enemy, you're dead. It's called treason. Or you're a slave. That's the default setting for human government. And um, so democracies and republics are attempts to take the power of a king and give it to the people. Ancient Israel was the first instance of this, but then you have the Greeks with their city-states and the Roman Republic, and, and it, it, they would work for a while. Israel's worked because they had a big magnet in the sky called God, so you were virtuous because you were accountable to God. Athens didn't have that. Plato says that the self-government's not going to work for a long time because human nature is selfish, and he called it virtue, and then the people don't have virtue. 380 BC, Plato said, People really don't have virtue. If someone was born that truly had virtue, the world would crucify him. He wrote, Plato wrote that 380 BC. And then you have the Roman Republic, and um, it kept getting a, a difference between a republic and democracy. Uh, democracy has two definitions. One is a general reference to the population, the populace being involved. And that was being used a lot in America during the Nazis and the Cold War, Truman contrasting us to the Soviets. So a general reference, but as a functioning form of government, demos means people, crossing means rule, a pure democracy, every citizen has to be at every meeting every day to talk about every issue. And it's very time consuming. And you, uh, and it, so it could only grow as large as a city. So they call them city-states because you physically had to be there every day. A republic is where you take care of your family and your farm and you have someone in your place that goes to the market every day. They are your representative. Easy way to remember the word republic begins with R-E-P. The word representative begins with R-E-P. A Republican form of government is a representative form of government. You're still the king, you're just ruling through representatives. We pledge allegiance to the flag and to the republic. We're basically pledging allegiance to us being in charge of ourselves. And so when somebody protests the flag, what they're saying is, I don't want to be the king anymore. In, in one of my talks, I go through how ancient Israel inspired the Protestants during the Reformation, and they basically founded New England, and they brought this uh, form of government without a king to America. But uh, I'll talk about that maybe this afternoon. So if democracies and republics are attempts to take the power of the king, give it to the people, what if the king wants it back? Does he just ask for it? Hi, I, I want to be the king. Uh, give me control of your life. Oh, okay, yeah, here you go. Is that how it happens? No. So there's two ways that kings can take the power away from the people. One is fear. When people get afraid, they will panic and trade their freedom for security. And the second is free stuff. <laughs> the king's so nice, he's giving you free stuff till you get dependent, and then you want some more, you're gonna have to incrementally give up your freedom. And so it's like a gang leader takes over a neighborhood two ways. He can come in with guns and get everybody into fear and they submit to the mob, or the, the drug dealer's so nice, he's giving away free drugs until you get hooked. And then you want some more, you're gonna have to sell yourself into prostitution, give up control of your life. It's like a, a hunter catches animals through guns or bait. Right? One's a, 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 a forward front door approach and the other's a, a, a sly uh, back door approach. You know, I was studying how to catch pigs in the wild. In Texas, they, uh, I was down there and they have lots of wild pigs and they're destroying, you know, f farmland. And, and so they, you put a post in the ground and you throw some corn down. And then the next day, you put two posts in the ground and throw corn down. The next day, three posts, four posts, and you keep putting them in like a semicircle and putting fencing in between until there's just a little opening. And you throw the corn on, the pigs squeeze through the opening and they're eating corn and you shut the gate and you caught yourself some wild pigs, right? You get this dependency. These are ways that, and so um, the um, different uh, ways that, uh, matter of fact, Stalin called it fear and food. You keep a large population in control by always keeping them in fear and then you always keep a food shortage. 
And because then they're dependent on the government. In China, they would limit families to one bowl of rice, you know, a day, and they didn't have time to <clears throat> plot, plot a, re a rebellion. So scriptures, fear of man bringeth a snare. Snare is a trap. When you make decisions out of fear, you are entering a trap. That's why over and over again, the Bible says, fear not, fear not. Well, I don't know what to do. Spend enough time in the presence of the Lord and in his word until you get peace in your heart, then make your decision. But do not make a decision out of fear. And then the other is, uh, every man is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Like, like Eve, you know, she saw that the apple was, you know, good for the uh, pride of life and, the, and so forth. So let's talk about fear. How do you create an atmosphere where an entire nation gets into fear so they'll trade with their security. You have to sow discord, right? When there's no discord, there's peace. It's like, I don't, I'm not in any reason to give up my freedoms. Everything's fine. So you have to sow discord. So how do you sow discord? Uh, a couple of scriptures, Psalms 133, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Everybody say unity. And then Proverbs 6 says, six things the Lord hates. And the last is he that soweth discord. Everybody say discord. We have unity, we have discord. Imagine being in heaven. There's unity until somebody comes along and sows discord in heaven. It happened. The name devil means to divide. He's dividing, he's sowing discord. And of course, he's cast out of heaven. He gets thrown down to earth. And what does he do? He sows discord in the garden with Adam blaming Eve and Cain killing Abel. And then we have this period of the Hebrew Republic that 400 years out of Egypt before King Saul. And Gideon defeats 100,000 Midianites. And nobody is even thinking about invading Israel after that. But Gideon has an illegitimate son named Abimelech. He wants power. He goes to the town of Shechem because his mom had been like a concubine to Gideon. And he, he goes to the men. He says, uh, he does critical race theory. He does uh, race identity politics. He says, is it better for you that the sons of Gideon reign over you? Remember also that I am your flesh and your bone. And then he, uh, the men of Shechem says, well, we got to vote for him because he is our brother. And so he uses this. And then they go to, to the temple of Baal Barith, the city treasury, and he takes money to hire protesters and rioters, Antifa, BLM type, to do what? It says, and they gave him three score and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Barith, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and worthless persons which followed him to do what? Commit violence, smash things, set things on fire, and kill all his half-brothers, the sons of Gideon. And then the men of Shechem made Abimelech king. So you take a country completely at peace, no threats, but on the inside, you sow division based on race. And um, so the Hebrew Republic would have ended here rather than a century later with King Saul had not somebody threw a millstone over the wall and it killed Abimelech. Anyway, so um, let's fast forward Machiavelli, Italy, 500 years ago, lots of city states. Venice, Genoa, Naples, Florence, Siena, and they're fighting. And Machiavelli thinks if one prince could control all of Italy, it would stop the infighting. So he writes a book called The Prince, where he advocates the ends justifies the means. The end of one prince controlling all of Italy is such a good end, because it'll stop this infighting, that any means necessary to get there is justified. Lie, cheat, steal. So if a prince conquers a city and the city does not want to be conquered, they would uh, hate him. But if the prince pays criminals, like Abimelech did, hired vain and worthless persons to do what? To commit violence. And they're smashing windows and setting things on fire. The people in the city will panic and want somebody to come in and restore order. And the prince can come in, get rid of the very criminals he bribed to create the mess. Nobody will know the better for it. And everyone will praise the prince as a hero. Right? And so it's good marketing. You create the need and fill it. You go around the back of the house and set it on fire. And then you go around the front of the house and sell them a fire extinguisher. And they'll pay anything for it and thank you for being there. Right? So if people are at peace, they're not going to give up their freedom. But you have to sow this discord. You have to get people to create these riots. You have to, you know, have uh, FBI entanglement type things. So, um, so Machiavellianism is called create or capitalize on a crisis to consolidate control. That's a mouthful. And um, so uh, Rahm Emanuel, 
said, you don't ever want a crisis to go to waste. It's an opportunity to do important things you would otherwise avoid. And Ben Dominich, Fox Primetime, Rahm Emanuel's famous dictum, never let a crisis go to waste. Normal times don't produce the outcomes that the authoritarian left wants because people are not scared enough to give them the limitless power they crave. Crises are necessary, and so if there aren't any on offer, they manufacture them. And so you and I see a crisis, our response is how can we help people through it? They see a crisis, their response is how can we usurp power through it? Henry Louis Mencken wrote, the urge to save humanity is almost always only a false face for the urge to rule it. Climate change, oh, the world, we got to. And um, so we talked about the devil sowing discord in heaven, sowing discord in the, in the garden with Adam, uh, you know, blaming Eve and Cain killing Abel and sowing discord with Abimelech uh, and then hiring vain and worthless persons and then Machiavelli sowing discord. Let's look at the British Empire. It did become the biggest empire on planet Earth. How did they get so big? Did they just walk into a little country and say, hi, we want to be the biggest empire on planet Earth. Uh, okay, here are the keys. Is, is that how it happened? No. So let's look at how they took over India. Around 1714, the British started a trading post in Bengal that turned into a trading fort, which turned into them having guns. And they got involved in local politics and they would give guns to one kingdom and guns to another kingdom and then sow discord between the kingdoms until they began to fight each other and bloody each other up and weaken each other and then the British would conquer both of the weakened kingdoms. And they did this again and again and again until they took over all of India. They did it in Kenya in Nigeria and they even did it in America during the Revolutionary War. Right, we had a century and the Americans and the Indians had sort of reached an equilibrium and the British went to the Mohawk Indians. General Johnny Burgoyne coming down from Canada in New York and he meets with the Mohawks and he stirs up discord and he promises them money for scalps. And so they scalp lots and lots of Americans. And it was so bad that it was mentioned in our Declaration of Independence as one of the 27 reasons why we were rebelling against the king. The king has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Right, so it was, we were getting along with the Indians but they wanted to stir this up. <clears throat> And the French Revolution, uh, you see again, a government wanting to stir up crises, uh, crush the enemies of the revolution. And uh, Robespierre was the one leading the French Revolution. Uh, he was their head of their committee of public safety, like their homeland security. And uh, he gives a speech in 1794 called Terror Justified. Lead the people by terror. Basis of popular government during a revolution is terror. Terror is nothing more than swift, severe, and flexible justice. Could you imagine the government having somebody in there that is planning terrorist attacks on their own population? And he would come up with a list in front of the assembly and say, okay, these are people that are disloyal to our new form of government that we've just usurped and killed the, the king. And he would read their names off and the mob would go out. They killed 30,000 people in Paris. They had to invent a nice head chop it off machine called the guillotine. And then they sent their army to the Vendee, a rural area, and they killed 300,000 men, women, and children, considered the first modern genocide. And, uh, and then back to America, War of 1812, and the British controlled Pensacola, Florida. Just north was Fort Mims, Alabama. And the British go to the Red Stick Creek Indians. Do you know the French pronunciation of Red Stick? Baton Rouge. Baton means stick, rouge means red. So the British go to the Red Stick Creek Indians and promise them money for scalps. And so the Red Stick Indians capture Fort Mims, Alabama. They capture 500 people and then they proceed to scalp them all. And this is what the historical marker says. Here in Creek Indian War, 1813-14, took place the most brutal massacre in American history. Indians took the fort with heavy loss, then killed all but about 36 of the some 550 in the fort. Creeks had been armed by British 
at Pensacola in this phase of the War of 1812. Do we really think the British Empire cared about the Red Stick Creek Indians? No, they were coming into an area where there was peace, they were sowing discord, and they were causing this crisis, why? Because they wanted to conquer both areas. And then you have Hegel. So we talked about the devil sowing discord in heaven, sowing discord uh, with the Adam blame and Eve, Cain killing Abel, sowing discord with Abimelech, sowing discord with Machiavelli, uh, sowing discord with the British Empire, and now we have Germany. So Napoleon conquers, and six million people die. Afterwards, the king of Prussia said, we can't get conquered that easy again. We, we need to strengthen our state. And he has a philosopher who's a professor at the University of Berlin named Hegel. And Hegel influenced Darwin, and Hegel had a student named Karl Marx, who was a member of the Young Hegelians at the University of Berlin. And so Hegel took what I just explained and made it into a nice, neat triangle. It's called dialectics. The thesis is the status quo, right? So it goes thesis is one corner, antithesis or antithesis on the opposite corner, and then the top is a synthesis. It sounds complicated, but it's not. In other words, you, thesis is the status quo. Everybody's been getting along the way they've been getting along. You have to create discord. You have to create an uncertain crisis. You have to create a problem that's real bad, and then everybody panics in fear and surrenders some of their freedom to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And then that becomes the new starting point thesis, and you create another antithesis, another crisis that's real bad and gets everybody to panic and fear, and they surrender some more of their freedoms to settle for an answer that's just half as bad. That becomes the new thesis starting point. You create another problem that's real bad. Everybody panics in fear again, and then they settle for an answer that's just half as bad. And every time they settle, they're giving up a little of their individual rights to the state. And um, so Karl Marx says, how do you create a problem that's real bad in a country? You send in agent, agent provocateurs, agitators, community organizers, labor, labor organizers, like Abimelech hired vain and worthless persons to commit violence, like Machiavelli. You get people to smash windows and set them on fire. You get these agitators, they create a crisis that makes everybody panic, and then everybody says, we need the government to come in and restore order. And the government's like, okay, we're glad you're asked. We're gonna come in, we're gonna restore order, we're gonna take away all your guns. We're gonna take away your freedom of speech because you might set something, some, somebody off. So we gotta sh shut, and we're gonna track you. And we're gonna, uh, you know, and, we're, and so they would begin to take, the, the answer is always, you have to give up some of your freedoms to solve this problem. And um, so, Karl Marx got a name for this. He called it critical theory. That's where you study a country and you see all the groups, economic groups, religious groups, racial groups, and you call some victims and others oppressors, haves and have-nots, and you pit them against each other to create discord. And so at first it was economic, proletariat versus the bourgeois, which was the poor against the rich. They organized the blacks against the whites, the Catholics against the Protestants, the Muslims against the Christians, even the Hutus against the Tutsis in the Congo and Rwanda. The people in Congo and Rwanda saw themselves as one, but the Belgian and German colonizers came in and measured them and their features and arbitrarily said, you are a Hutu and you're a Tutsi. And they made them go down to the government and register as a Hutu, as a Tutsi, and then they stirred up discord between them, and, and they even fought each other and genocided each other and weakened each other, and then the colonizing power said, well, we're gonna come in and restore order. And everybody's like, oh, thank you for restoring order. Yeah, they were behind it. I talked to people in India, they said, yeah, that's what the British did in India, right? This is the standard model. And so it's interesting that Patrice Cullors, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, said we are trained Marxists come in, identify groups, put the groups against each other, so discord, and then everybody surrenders their freedom to the government for a solution. Castro said the revolution needs the enemy. The revolutionary needs his antithesis, which is the counter-revolutionary. And if enemies were lacking, they had to be fabricated. In other words, you can't get people to give up their freedoms if everything's fine. You have to get them into fear. There has to be an enemy to organize against. And if there are no enemies, you, you make them up, you fabricate them. Like a Christian nationalist or a, a white supremacist, you try to make some boogeyman that's not really not there, and you wanna make them into the enemy so that you have a reason to make people into fear to give up their freedoms to fight them.
Jesus talked about this. He said, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Uh, Lincoln said a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's, it's introducing an autoimmune disease into the body politic. What's an autoimmune disease? It's where your own immune system starts attacking your own organs. You have a war going on inside of your own body. And so we have the body politic. You come in and you get it to fight itself within the country. Like Abimelech, all of Israel, but he gets the men of Shechem, the right to fight the rest. Like Machiavelli, you come in, you get these groups to fight each other. Uh, the British Empire getting groups to fight each other. Hegel to get the groups to fight each other. So how do you destroy a marriage? So division. How do you destroy a family? So division. How do you destroy a church? So division. How do you destroy a country? So division. So critical race theory, patriotism is the enemy. You get people to identify with subgroups and you pit the subgroups against each other to, to create division, to create discord, to get everybody into panic and fear so they'll surrender their freedoms. Franklin Roosevelt said, whoever seeks to set one nationality against another seeks to degrade all nationalities. Whoever seeks to set one race against another seeks to enslave all races. And then he says, January 2nd, 1942, remember the Nazi technique, pit race against race, religion against religion, prejudice against prejudice, divide and conquer. I saw this quote from Charles Barkley, the NBA basketball player on a CBS sports panel, April 2021. He said, man, I think most white people and black people are great people. I really believe that in my heart. But I think our system is set up where our politicians, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, are designed to make us not like each other so they can keep their grasp of money and power. He says, we're so stupid following our politicians. Now, there are some good ones and we got to get behind them, right? Um, their only job is, hey, let's make the whites and blacks not like each other. Let's make the rich people and the poor people not like each other. Let's scramble the middle class. I really believe that in my heart. And so taking this sowing division more to the present, we have Chicago, we have Al Capone, and we have a guy named Saul Alinsky that's riding around with Capone's hitman, Frank Nitti. And so how all he had to do was go into a neighborhood, kill a few people, smash a few windows, the whole neighborhood would panic in fear. There's discord and they would submit to the mob and Solinsky says, well, this is easy. Let's just apply this to politics. And so he influenced our politics. He even, um, uh, Hillary Clinton did her senior thesis at Wellesley College on Saul Alinsky. And even a former president was a Kalinsky organizer in Chicago. And so Saul Linsky says the first step in community organization is community disorganization. Disruption of the present organization is the first step. The organizer's first job is to create the issues or the problems. The organizer must first rub raw the resentments of the people of the community. An organizer must stir up dissatisfaction and discontent. The fan the latent hostilities of many of the people to the point of overt expression. The organizer polarizes the issue, helps lead his forces into conflict. He must search out controversy, for unless there is controversy, the people are not concerned enough to act. And in the front of his book, he has an acknowledgement to Lucifer. We started off talking about Lucifer, and in the front of his book, he says, lest we forget, at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement of the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively, he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. That's his M.O., modus operandi. That's what he does. He sows division. And uh, Alinsky, in Rolling Stone magazine, March 72, just a couple months before his death in June of 72, Alinsky said, if there is an afterlife and I have anything to say about it, I will unreservedly choose to go to hell. <laughs> hell would be heaven for me. Once I get into hell, I'll start organizing the have-nots over there. They're my kind of people. Now, I don't think that is what hell is. And uh, anyway, so 
Not only do they create the crises to sow discord so they can usurp power, they blame you for creating the crises. They blame you for sowing the discord. It's something called psychological projection, where the attacker blames the victim. Blame shifting. You accuse others of what you do. And so uh, it's in the Bible. Uh, so it's a psychological, it's a narcissistic defense mechanism to avoid responsibility. And uh, little kids do it. I didn't start the fight, you did. Or uh, a cheating spouse will accuse the faithful spouse of being unfaithful. And uh, Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of lusting after her when she was lusting after him. And you have Ahab seeing the prophet Elijah, and Ahab says, well, you're the troubler of Israel. And Elijah's like, uh-uh, you're the one troubling Israel. You're, one, you're blaming me for your problems. And then Jesus talked about it. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but fail to notice the beam in your own? You hypocrite. First, take the beam out of your own eye. So here, they're the ones that have the beam, but they're blaming you, right, for the speck. They're the ones that are doing the bad stuff, but they're wanting to blame you for it. And they did it to the Apostle Paul. He's in the temple in Jerusalem praying. Some Pharisees see him and they start a riot and they're pulling Paul apart and the Romans rescue Paul and then there's a trial. And the Pharisees send a prosecuting attorney named Tertullus who begins to accuse Paul saying, we have found this man a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among the Jews uh, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who's gone about to profane the temple. And Paul answered, they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, nor in the synagogue, nor in the city, neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. The Pharisees started the insurrection at the Capitol, but they wanted to blame this innocent Paul for doing it. And Nero did it. He wanted to build a project in Rome, but there was this poor area, about a quarter of the city, where a lot of Christians lived. He set it on fire, and he blamed the Christians for it. And so he began the first persecution of Christians. The Christians were innocent. He does the crime. He blames these innocent Christians for the crime, and he proceeds to kill lots of Christians. And they did it to Jesus. Here are these Pharisees, right? Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. These Pharisees had the audacity to accuse Jesus himself of being demon-possessed. And Adam did it to God, right? He blame-shifted. Adam sinned, but he says, well, it's, it's the woman you gave me. It, it's really your fault. It's the sinful man's response is to blame the innocent person for the guilt that they're doing. And so David Axelrod was a campaign manager, uh, advisor to a previous president. And he said in NPR radio, April 19th, 2010, in Chicago, there was an old tradition of throwing a brick through your own campaign office window and then calling a press conference to say you've been attacked, right? You blame the innocent people. And they're like, I didn't do it. Let's say there's a, let's say there's a secretary of state who is colluding with Russia, giving away a fifth of the U.S. uranium to Russia, and coincidentally getting a $145 million contribution from Russian oligarchs to her Clinton Foundation. She pays for a steel dossier to accuse her opponent of colluding with Russia. And he has to go through all the impeachment trials and all the investigations. And when it ever gets pointed back at her, by that time, it's old news, the water's muddy, the public doesn't know who to trust, and she gets a pass. And interestingly enough, the investigation of Trump was an excuse for the government to get all the evidence that could convict Hillary and destroy it. Let's get these laptops, destroy them. Let's get these servers, let's destroy them. Let's get the text messages, let's erase them. Let's get the emails, let's erase them. Let's destroy all, the, right? And then let's say there's a candidate that is um, extorting Ukraine, saying stop investigating my son or I'm gonna hold back billions of dollars of USA. What did they do? They accuse his opponent of extorting Ukraine, the exact crime. 
Why? So that people make a mental association where there's smoke, there's fire. They're, they hear this person's name is, is next to this, right? And if it ever gets pointed back at him, by that time, the water's muddied, the public doesn't know who to trust, and he gets a pass. You know, I'm convinced that they knew that uh, Biden had documents in his garage next to his Corvette. And they knew at some point it was going to come public that when he was vice president, he got all these documents that had to do with Ukraine, that had to do with all kinds of business deals that his son was involved in. And, uh, and he's like, uh oh, this is going to come to light. What did they do? They intentionally staged a very public raid of Mar-a-Lago for one reason only, the headlines. They wanted to make really big headlines that Trump's got these documents he's not supposed to. And they make a big headline, big headline. And then it finally comes out that, that Biden had documents. And it's like, well, uh, I, I guess it's OK. And, and Biden gets a pass, right? So these are tactics where they want to accuse you of what they're guilty of. They need a crisis, but they want to blame you for the very crisis that they're doing. And so there's a term that gets thrown in called false flags. And that's, again, a blame, a blaming you. So where did this come from? I spoke in Beaufort, North Carolina, and that's where Blackbeard's Queen Anne Revenge was sunk. Blackbeard was a pirate, and after the British started cracking down on pirates, he decided to downsize. <laughs> and so he like dumped off a bunch of pirates and sunk this ship and then went on. Um, so. Uh, but they have this museum there. And so I spoke at this big event. They had congressmen and judges. And it was right there on the water. You could see the waves. It was like really pretty. And um, the person driving me around uh, was the head of the museum. And he was telling me about Blackbeard stuff. And he says, you know, they, the pirates really did not want to kill you. Because if they got into an actual battle and get wounded, there are no pirate hospitals to go to, right? And, uh, and plus, they didn't want to blow up the ship because they want all the booty from the ship. And so they wanted to basically get you into fear so that you'll panic and give up your freedoms. And so they would raise a flag of a friendly nation in distress. And so the other nation would be looking through the telescope and they'd be like, oh, there's one of our country's ships. And look, oh, they're having problems. And let's go over and help them. And they would get closer and closer and closer until they got too close where they could not get away. And then they take down the friendly flag, the false flag, and they put up a pirate flag. And all of a sudden, these people are like, oh, no. And they can't get away because their ship is slow. And the pirates, Blackbeard was like 6'8", big mop of black hair, big black beard. And he took the wicks that you would light the cannon with. And he would light them on fire and stick them in his beard and in his hair. He'd have pistols in both hands, dagger in his teeth, and these pirates would jump onto the ship and the people were like, oh, look, take my money. <laughs> right? It was to shock and awe. It was to go for this effect where you plan something to get people suddenly into panic so they'll give up their freedoms. And so let's look at this in a political military sense. 1700, Sweden was a big country. It had a rival country, Russia. And the king of Sweden wanted to attack Russia, get into a fight. But his parliament would not approve the funding. So a Sweden's king, Gustav III, had the tailor of the Royal Swedish Opera sew Russian uniforms. And then he had Swedish soldiers put on the Russian uniforms and stage an attack at a Swedish outpost at Pumala. And the word spreads across the country that the Russians had attacked Sweden. And by the time it gets to Stockholm, the parliament panics and says, OK, we'll approve the funding for the king's war that he wanted from the very beginning. And uh, the Nazis did this. They wanted to invade Poland. But world public opinion wouldn't support it. So they had Nazi soldiers dress up as Polish soldiers and attack a German outpost at Gleiwitz that happened to have a radio tower. And the German, Nazis dressed as Germans are attacking, and the radio's like, oh, the Polish are attacking. Um, but the Nazis dressed as Polish were attacking. And, and they would give the play-by-play. -play. Well, the Polish are killing here, the Polish are shooting here, the Polish are... And this news report gets spread around the country, around the world, that the Polish had attacked. And the Nazis are like, well, you started it, so we have an excuse to invade Poland and to take it over in 1939 and start World War II. And the... Uh, 
Russians did it. So the Russians wanted to invade Finland. World public opinion wouldn't support it. And so the Soviets shell a Russian village on the Finnish border and make it look like the Finns had shelled the village. And the media picks it up that the Finns started it and the Russians have an excuse to invade Finland in the Winter War of 1939. And then the Japanese did it. They had a railroad on the coast of China near Mukden and they claim that a explosion took place and destroyed their railroad. And so the Japanese invade China and kill over 100,000 in Nanking, China. Later, there was an international investigation. They walked the entire length of the railroad and there was no explosion. It's like, what, maybe a, a spike was missing or something? They simply fabricate, they made up an excuse so they could invade and kill hundreds of thousands of people. And then Turkey did a similar thing. Constantinople was changed to Istanbul, which in Greek means the city, and that was the capital of Christian Europe for a thousand years. The Byzantine Empire, Greek Orthodox. Well, the, uh, the Turks invade, and by 1955, there is a um, small remnant of Greeks. So you had a, a leader named Ataturk, who was the founder of the Turkish Republic, and he wanted to have a secular government. He outlawed the fezes, outlawed the Arabic language, uh, outlawed the calls to prayer, first one to let women uh, be educated, first one to have women hold office. So Ataturk was a modern leader, and he said, um, Islam is nothing more than Arab politics, and Turkey was a great nation before the Arabs came in. And, so he was a moderate leader, but then you got a guy named Menderes, 1955, and he wants to get back to this fundamentalist, Islamist, caliphate type thing. But he's bothered by this Greek community in Istanbul. And so he has a plan. And the plan was for a Turkish university student to put a bomb in the Turkish consulate over in Greece and in Ataturk's birthplace over in Greece and blow it up and then to stir up the people of Constantinople to attack this Greek neighborhood. The bomb never went off, but the newspapers ran with the story anyway. A bomb, a bomb, and it stirs the people of Istanbul to attack this Greek neighborhood and smash the stores, smash their businesses and their homes, and smash their churches, and basically drive out. Here's this innocent little community and they plan something and they uh, get destroyed. And recently, Erdogan did a similar thing. He ran for office as a secular leader. Once he gets in, he starts moving in the fundamentalist direction. The Economist magazine said, democracy is like a train, said Mr. Erdogan once. You get off once you've reached your destination. You get democratically elected, and then once you're in, you become a dictator. And when he started to have a uh, anti-Erdogan movement growing, uh, he decided to stage a coup against himself. And he flies in an airplane and lands and claims there was this coup. He pulls out a list of 30,000 of his political opponents and has them zip tied taken away. And when the dust settles, he didn't have any political opponents left. And uh, Stalin did a similar thing. 1939, there was a growing anti-Stalinist movement. At the same time, Stalin had a supporter, Sergei Kirov, very popular. They built a statue to him in Leningrad. And so he was getting a little too popular for Stalin's comfort. So Stalin had an idea. He would assassinate his friend, Sergei Kirov, and eliminate a potential rival and blame the assassination on the anti-Stalinists. Everybody would believe it because the anti-Stalinists didn't like Stalin and they didn't like Sergei supporting Stalin. Stalin used this as an excuse to have some hearings to do some investigation, some questioning, to bring people in, to lock them away, and to kill over a million people in the first great purge of 1936 to 38. And Hitler did a similar thing. Germany was a republic, but there was a party called the National Socialist Workers Party, and the head of it was Hitler. And this party had a little, a violent group, sort of like Abimelech's vain and worthless persons, sort of like Machiavelli, Sort of like the British, you know, stirring up uh, the dissension. And so Hitler's under the table group were called brown shirts. 
They were the aunt of a BLM of the day. They were nicknamed Sturmabteilung, which means stormtroopers. And they would storm into the meetings of Hitler's opponents and disrupt the meeting. And then they would lock arms and block access to public buildings. Could you imagine people locking arms in public? And then they uh, blocked streets. And then they went into the cities and they smashed windows and burnt and looted and set on fire over 7,500 stores owned by Jews in the night of broken glass, crystal knocked. And then did I mention uh, their capital got set on fire? The burning of the Reichstag? And uh, in the confusion, Hitler decides to have some hearings, some investigations, and to bring people in for questioning, to arrest them, to lock them away, and to shoot them without a trial. And when the dust settled, Hitler didn't have any political opponents, and Germany transitioned from a republic to a dictatorship. And so we have this sowing of division blaming the enemies. You know, Tucker Carlson showed this clip of the video of the very first people to break into the U.S. Capitol. And they're coming in in military style. Some will go this way, some will go that way. They're, they're dressed in tactical gear. And, uh, and lo and behold, there was no group of Trump supporters dressed in tactical gear. And then it begins to come out that the FBI had people in the crowd, right? Assets embedded in the crowd. And then there's Ray Epps. And lo and behold, uh, he is on film the night before saying, we got to break in, we got to break in. And then when they're, he's filmed pulling back barricades, he's filmed motioning people in, he's, he's texted, said, I'm orchestrating the whole thing. And then the FBI is like, oh, we don't want to pay attention to him. And, uh, and then he's pictured in this picture, the one guy with the baseball hat looking this way, had been at all of the Antifa BLM rights in 60 cities trashing them across the country. And there's eyewitnesses that says, we saw Antifa people go into the bushes and put on Trump t-shirts and then assault the Capitol. And um, you know, Imprimis Magazine had an article, What is the Great Reset? And it talked about doing this globally. So Klaus Schwab, World Economic Forum, Theory Mallory, right. But if the past five centuries in Europe and America have taught us anything, it is that acute crises contribute to boosting the power of the state. And um, I thought this was interesting. This is Peter Thiel, founder of PayPal. And he's giving a speech at Stanford last year. And he said, the zeitgeist or the attitude on the other side is, we are not going to make it for another century on this planet. Therefore, we need to embrace a one world totalitarian state right now. Whatever the dangers are in the future, we need never underestimate the danger of a one world totalitarian state. And then he quotes scripture. First Thessalonians 5, 3, the political slogan of the antichrist is peace and safety. I want to suggest we would do well to be a little more scared of the antichrist and a little less scared of Armageddon. What's he talking about? Let's be less scared of the world ending. Climate change, oh, all this you know, population explosion. Let's be less scared about the world crises and be scared of the people that promise to save us from the world crises, right? The people that create the problem behind it. And of course, we don't need to be scared of anybody because we have Jesus and he is in charge. So, And I'll get it into this afternoon. I'll, I have a presentation where I give uh, all of the creation or redemption from God's point of view. It's, it's fascinating. So the globalist tactic is get people into fear. Then they will trade their freedom for security on a local level, on a national level, and on a global level. But the Lord's response is fear not. Perfect love casts out fear. I mean, God made you out of nothing. He loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross to pay for your sins. He wants to spend eternity with you. The more you spend time in God's presence and realize how big he is, then you, you, you realize that you can trust him. And he's doing what he's doing basically to turn up the heat. And so you, um, in, you, in you read Deuteronomy 28, but then you read Leviticus, I think it's 25. And it says, a nation that hearkens to the voice of the Lord will be blessed. A nation that does not hearken to the voice of the Lord. Uh, and Leviticus says, these bad things will happen. And if they still don't turn, these bad, bad things are going to happen. And if they still don't turn, these bad, bad, bad things are going to happen. In other words, God says, um, 
Uh, there's plan A and plan B. Plan A is he blesses you and you love him back out of gratefulness. He really wants a relationship with you. If that doesn't work, there is plan B. And that's he, he hides his face and he lets you experience the consequences of your selfish decisions and then you turn to him out of desperation. And then some people are a little more stubborn so he, he lets their problems get a little bit worse and then they'll finally turn to him out of desperation. And then others, he turns up the heat and it gets even worse, worse. And then finally some more people will turn to him and then it turns up some more and then it gets real and people say, okay, and they finally are flat on their back and look, God, help me. But then everybody that's turned, that's gonna turn, has turned and what does he do with the rest of them? He turns up the heat and he fries it, right? Anyway, God's just, he has to judge the sin. So uh, as more power concentrates into fewer hands globally, God's counterbalance is to have more people involved locally. And so he wants to get us involved when and it's, he's letting evil expose itself. So you see all this wicked stuff and it's like some people are going to be fine with the wicked stuff. It's like, okay, they're making their decision. It's like, look, we're going to pull back the curtain. Uh, here's Satan clubs on high school campuses, Satan worshiping Grammys, you know, all the trans stuff. And, um, and some people are going to be fine with it. Oh, okay. And others are like, look, I, I was silent long enough. I can't be silent anymore. And, and they cut the rubber band and they get more excited about Jesus. And so God is pushing the world. Josiah had a grandfather, Manasseh, wicked, sacrificing children to Moloch. There's nothing more unjust than killing an innocent baby that didn't do anything wrong. And a just God cannot be silent because otherwise he'd be giving consent to it. Like a wedding ceremony, if you're silent, they're giving consent. If God's silent, he's giving consent. And he can't give consent because he's a just God. And um, so Manasseh has prophets come to him and says, you're doing the same thing that the people that were here before Israel did. And because they were doing it, I brought Israel in to judge them. And because you're doing it, I'm going to drive you out. Manasseh dies. His grandson, Josiah, is a teenager starts to seek the Lord. He's the king. They're cleaning out the temple that his granddad had trashed. They find the law of God. They read it to this young king. He rips his garments and repents. And then he sends to a prophetess in town, a woman named Holda, the wife of the king's tailor. And she says, judgment's coming, but not during your lifetime because you, the king, repented. And so I believe that if we repent, and so Josiah had this huge Passover, right? And Josiah sent the Levites out to teach the law. And Josiah tore down all these Sodomite temples and there was this revival. And, uh, and it lasted for, for his 31 year reign. Who knows? But if we repent, God can put off his timetable. That's, uh, that's one of the reasons maybe it's so hard to try to figure out the date because maybe he's giving himself some leeway. I don't know. And um, so, you know, I read through lots of history. Every, so, so here's a way of explaining it. You have a... Um, freshman chemistry class. A teacher has a beaker with a solution and pours in a catalyst that causes a reaction and some stuff precipitates and gets heavy and settles to the bottom of the beaker and other stuff gets effervescent and bubbly and floats to the top of the beaker. The time period we're living in, so every generation has a crisis. Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, bubonic plague, Spanish flu, World War I. Every generation has a crisis and that crisis is a catalyst that causes a reaction. And some people's reaction is to run away and hide and deny their faith and deny Jesus and even take the mark of the beast. How am I going to survive without the government? And other people's response to the crisis is, God, where do you need me? I'm dead. My life is hit with Christ and God. And historically, the Christians would run to the need. All right? There's, there's a bubonic plague. They'd run to try to help out. There's a crisis. They'd run, right? And it's a, when the early church was persecuted, what did they do? They prayed for boldness, right? It's the same crisis that causes two reactions. The same crises that is going to cause some people to panic and fear and submit to the Antichrist, that same crisis is going to cause the body of Christ to get more excited about Jesus and be more bold for Jesus. So if we get through this crisis, there'll be another one. We get through that crisis, there'll be another one. Jesus says, wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. And um, so the same crises that causes corrupt power to concentrate into the hands of fewer people, that same crises will cause some people to turn to Christ, and it's in times of crises that God raises up leaders. Right? We would never would have heard of David, Gideon, Moses, right, if it had not been for a crisis. And we're the bride of Christ. Every romance novel builds up to a decision-making moment of forsaking of all others and choosing the one. I think God is pushing the world to a decision-making moment. And some people are going to choose the all others. 
I want to be liked. I want to be friended. I, I don't want people to not invite me. I don't want them to block me. And others were like, I don't care about the all others. All I care about is Jesus. So um, uh, in closing, I just want to remind you that someday you'll be dead. That's a nice way to end a talk. And, uh, and you're going to be in heaven because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. And when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, with no less days to sing his praise than when we just begun, imagine you have been in heaven for 10,000 years. You're walking the streets of gold. You meet Moses. Maybe Moses will invite you over to his place. I don't know what it's like in heaven, but I bet Moses will have a pretty nice place. Maybe like today, this size. Maybe he'll have one of those big fireplaces where the logs don't burn up. Get it? The burning bush in the wilderness didn't burn up and the logs in his fireplace didn't burn. I heard one preacher say, in heaven you'll travel as fast as you think and I'll probably show up late. <laughs> My wife will say, where were you? I was thinking about something else. I don't know. And we finally all get there and after the small talk's over, Moses is sitting right in front of you. You tap him on the shoulder. You say, Moses, tell us the story. I, I read the book. I even saw the movie. And... and <laughs> Room will get quiet. Moses will stand up and he goes, I was 80 years old. And it was a crisis, right? This Pharaoh this, who embodied the Antichrist of that era, he, he had his military, these chariots, and they were charging in at us. And we were totally unarmed. And I just stood there in faith, trusting God, holding up my staff. I said, God, use me. Use me to deliver your people. And the waves came in and swallowed up Pharaoh's chariots. We're going to say, wow. And we're going to look around the room and see David. Say, David, tell us your story. Room will get quiet. David will stand up. He goes, I was just a teenager. And this giant thug Goliath was mocking our God and making fun of our faith. And these grown-ups were too chicken to do anything. I said, enough of that. Took my little sling, hit him in the head, took his own sword and chopped his head off. And then we're going to hear Gideon tell his story and Deborah and the Apostle Paul. It's going to be really exciting. And then everyone in the room is going to look at you. Say, you tell us your story. What did you do when it was your turn to be down there on earth? What were they saying about God in your country? Or the baby that the Lord knew in the mother's womb? Or the sex that God made them male and female? What did you do when the whole world was against you and they're sitting on the edge of their seats? What are you going to say? You know, I'd hate for any of us to be up there and Jesus walk in the room and a screen come down and show all kinds of great things and people come to the Lord and him saying, this is what I had planned for you to do down there on earth, but you, you just didn't have enough faith and courage. And you look back at your life and that mountain that held you back it was a little anthill, a little, little, little fear of man. You said, I let that little fear of man, what people are going to think about me, hold me back from doing all this great stuff for Jesus. And you can't go back to earth and do anything else for Jesus because you're already in heaven because you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all your sins. But guess what? We're still on this earth. We still have breath in our lungs. We still have feet to try the soil. You still can do those things you'll be known for forever. God chose for you to be alive right now at this time in history, and he wants to use you in a powerful way for his glory. God bless you. Amen.